Thank you, Mrs. King. We are honored to have Governor John Ashcroft, Governor of the State of Missouri, present to us our prayer for national leaders. Governor Ashcroft. You know, it was nearly 2,000 years ago that Paul wrote to a friend of his, Timothy, and he said, I exhort you, therefore, to pray one for another, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. That's good advice now, just as it was then. I can't think of a more noble aspiration than that we would lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty. I would like to ask you to stand with me and stand in prayer for the leaders of our country and leaders of nations around the world. And please join me in prayer as we petition God to bless those who lead us. Father of the universe and creator of us all, we bear before you today those who minister to us and minister to you who are our leaders. We thank you for leaders who are sensitive to your spirit. In particular, we lift up our president, Ronald Reagan and Nancy and the Reagan family. Together, we pray for them. We pray for our Vice President, George Bush and Barbara and the Bush family. Father, we covet your blessings for them. We ask you to bless them. We pray for the members of the cabinet who have joined us here this morning and who serve to translate policy into program for the people. We ask that you would inspire them. For the members of the Congress, both the Senate and the House, Father, we express our gratitude and we invoke your blessing. Strengthen them. Give them courage. For the members of the Supreme Court and the judiciary, we pray your blessing upon them as they rightly settle disputes that come before us. We know that blessed are the peacemakers. Revive us again, all of us. Fill each heart with your love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Creator of us all, create us again, again in your image, that we would do your will. We pray that in all of us, your will be done. In our leaders, we pray. Thy will be done. For our leaders and for the people, we pray for wisdom. We know that when Solomon prayed for wisdom, you blessed him and the nation richly. We pause to pray for wisdom. For our leaders and for ourselves, we pray for righteousness. For we know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. For our leaders and for ourselves, we pray for vision. Help us to see ourselves for what we are. Help us to see you for who you are. Help us to see ourselves through your, your eyes for what we ought to be and what we can be. We pray for vision because we know that where there is no vision, the people perish. Father, endow us with vision, a vision of your truth. For as long as he sought the Lord, God made us to prosper. Make us to prosper. Father, we pray for our leaders that they be listeners as well as leaders, and that we as well listen. Help us all amid our responsibilities to lead, to listen, 
to listen to your voice, the still small voice of justice within us. This morning we pray for peace, peace among nations, peace in ourselves, peace with you, peace in our families. Father, give us all your peace today. And Father, help us to participate and our leaders to participate in your redemptive mission of forgiveness in the world. Through forgiveness, free us from the past that we might face a future of opportunity and service. Father, endow us all with memory. May we and our leaders remember now and forever that thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Governor Ashcroft, we thank you for that inspiring prayer. Our speaker this morning is a woman who has distinguished herself in many ways. Elizabeth Hanford Dole is an honors graduate of Duke University where she served as student body president. She also received a master's degree in education from Harvard and a doctorate in law from Harvard Law School. Mrs. Dole has served in several important government positions and currently serves in the president's cabinet as secretary of transportation. But more important than these, Elizabeth Dole is a woman whose personal convictions and strong faith serve as an example for us all. Please welcome our speaker this morning, the Honorable Elizabeth Dole, Secretary of Transportation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. King, Dr. Graham, distinguished colleagues and guests, I consider it one of the greatest possible privileges to be invited to share this morning a little of my own spiritual journey with fellow travelers. Like most of us, I am just one person struggling to relate faith to life. But I'm grateful that members of the congressional prayer groups have asked me to speak from the heart about the difference that Jesus Christ has made in my life. But first, I must mention a political crisis, a crisis from which I've learned some very important lessons. Now, this is a political crisis involving high stakes, intrigue, behind the scenes negotiations, influence in high places and even a little romance. Where have I learned of this crisis? On the front page of the newspapers? No, the newspapers haven't carried this story. No, the political crisis I'm talking about occurred around 2,450 years ago. And we learn about it in the Bible, in the book of Esther. Esther is the saga of a woman forced to make a decision concerning the total commitment of her life, a decision she was reluctant to make. She had to be vigorously challenged, and it's this part of her story to which I can so easily relate in my own spiritual journey. For while the particulars of her challenge may differ greatly from the challenges that you and I face, the forces at work are as real as the moral is relevant. The basic lessons Esther had to learn are lessons I needed to learn. Thus, the story of Esther over the years has taken on great significance for me. Indeed, it reflects an individual's discovery of the true meaning of life. The story takes place in the ancient kingdom of Persia, where there lived a particularly faithful man of God named Mordecai. Now, Mordecai, a Jew, had a young cousin named Esther whom he had adopted after the death of her parents and raised as if she were his own daughter. In fact, Mordecai had raised a young woman literally fit for a king. For Esther grew into a woman of extraordinary grace and beauty. 
Then one day Xerxes, the king of Persia, commanded that a search be made throughout all the provinces for the most beautiful women so that he could choose a new queen, a sort of Miss Persia pageant. <laughs> Esther, above all others, found favor in the eyes of the king, and this young orphan girl was crowned queen of Persia. The king was so delighted with his new queen that he threw a magnificent banquet and even went so far as to lower all the taxes. Mr. President, <laughs> I thought you would particularly like that part of the story. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mordecai, out amongst the people, learned to his horror that one of the top men in government had developed a very careful plan to put to death all of God's people, the Jews, throughout the entire kingdom. Of course, Mordecai immediately thought of Esther, and he sent an urgent message saying, Esther, you must do something. You may be the only person who can persuade the king to call off this terrible plan. But Esther wants no part of this. Her response to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has set but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the golden scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. In other words, Esther is saying, Mordecai, you don't understand protocol. I have to follow standard operating procedures. Chances are that if I go to the king, I just might lose my head. Well, Mordecai has no sympathy with Esther's refusal to help. Tens of thousands of her own people stand to lose their heads. Mordecai feels compelled to send a second message to Esther. I once heard a very insightful pastor, Gordon McDonald, highlight three distinct parts to this second appeal, three profound challenges which strike at the heart of Esther's reluctance. First, Esther, think not that you'll escape this predicament any more than other Jews. You'll lose everything you have if this plan is carried out, all the comforts, all the fringe benefits. It seems that Mordecai is saying, if the thing that stops you from being a servant to thousands of people is your comfort and your security, forget it, lady, for you're no more secure in there than we are out here. Esther shares the predicament. The second theme is privilege. If you keep silent, Esther, at a time like this, deliverance and relief will arise from some other place. God has given you, Esther, the privilege to perform. If you don't use that privilege, he may permit you to be pushed aside and give your role to someone else. The third theme is providence. Mordecai says, Esther, who knows, but that God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. Finally, Mordecai's appeal struck home. <clears throat> Esther's response, Go, gather together all the Jews and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. That's total commitment. Indeed, the story of Esther is for me a very challenging and humbling one. For there came a time in my life when I had to confront what commitment to God is all about. My witness contains no road to Damascus experience. My spiritual journey began many years ago in a Carolina home where Sunday was the Lord's Day, reserved for acts of mercy and necessity. And the gospel was as much a part of our lives as fried chicken and azaleas in the spring. My grandmother, Mom Kathy, who lived within two weeks of her 100th birthday, was my role model. I remember many Sunday afternoons with other neighborhood children in her home, the lemonade and cookies, I think that's what enticed us, the Bible games, listening to Mom Kathy as she read from this Bible, which is now one of my most cherished possessions. She practiced what she preached, 
and lived her life for others. In a tragic accident, Mom Kathy lost a son at the hands of a drunk driver. The insurance policy on his life built a hospital wing and a far-off church mission in Pakistan. Although Mom was not at all a wealthy woman, almost anything she could spare went to ministers at home and missions abroad. When it became necessary in her 90s to go into a nursing home, she welcomed the opportunity. I can still hear her saying, Elizabeth, there might be some people there who don't know the Lord, and I can read the Bible to them. I love to find her notes in the margin of her Bible, notes written in the middle of the night when she couldn't sleep. For example, I find by Psalm 139 this notation, May 22, 1952, 1 a.m., my prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I can't remember an unkind word escaping Mom's lips in all the years I knew her, or an ungracious deed marring her path. My grandmother was an almost perfect role model, and I wanted to be like her. From an early age, I had an active church life, but as we move along, how often in our busy lives something becomes a barrier to total commitment of one's life to the Lord. In some cases, it may be money, power, prestige. In my case, my career became of paramount importance. I worked very hard to excel, to achieve. My goal was to do my best, which is all fine and well, but I'm inclined to be a perfectionist. And it's very hard, you know, to try to control everything, surmount every difficulty, foresee every problem, realize every opportunity. That can be pretty tough on your family, your friends, your fellow workers, and on yourself. In my case, it began crowding out what Mom Kathy had taught me were life's most important priorities. I was blessed with a beautiful marriage, a challenging career, and yet only gradually over many years did I realize what was missing. My life was threatened with spiritual starvation. I prayed about this, and I believe no faster than I was ready, God led me to people and circumstances that made a real difference in my life. I found Ed Bauman of Foundry Methodist Church, a tremendously sensitive, caring pastor, who helped me see what joy there can be when God is the center of life and all else flows from that center. A spiritual growth group gave me renewed strength as I began to meet each Monday night with others who shared my need to stretch and grow spiritually, and I was strengthened through Bible study with other Senate wives. I learned that Sundays can be set aside for spiritual and personal rejuvenation without disastrous effects on one's work week. And suddenly, the story of Esther took on new meaning. I finally realized I needed to hear and to heed those challenges Mordecai so clearly stated. Mordecai's first challenge, predicament. Don't think your life will be spared from the slaughter, Esther. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it all. It's a call to total commitment, to literally lay her life on the line. But I can sympathize with Esther's dilemma. She had all the comforts, a cushy life. And when you get all those things around you, it can build up a resistance to anything which might threaten that comfort and security they seem to provide. I know all too well how she felt. Perhaps you do too. I enjoy the comfortable life. I had built up my own little self-sufficient world. I had God neatly compartmentalized, crammed into a crowded file drawer of my life somewhere between gardening and government. That is, until it dawned on me that I share the predicament, that the call to commitment Mordecai gave to Esther is like the call which Jesus Christ presents to me. If anyone would come after me, Jesus tells us, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul. Hard words to swallow when you're busy doing your own thing, but the most compelling logic I've ever heard. For if Christ is who he says he is, 
our Savior, the central figure in all of history who gives meaning to a world of confusing, conflicting priorities, then I had to realize Christ could not be compartmentalized. It would be different if I had believed that Jesus was just a man, as some do, then I could easily have compartmentalized him. Or if I had believed he was just a good teacher of morals, then perhaps I could have just put his book away on my shelf. Or if I had thought he was just a prophet, even then I might have been tempted to file him away. But I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and my Savior, the risen Lord who lives today, sovereign over all, and I knew it was time to cease living life backwards, time to strive to put Christ first, preeminent, with no competition at the very center of my life. It was time to submit my resignation as master of my own little universe. And God accepted my resignation. <clears throat> Mordecai's second challenge was privilege. If you don't take this privilege seriously, Esther, God will give it to another. This, too, was a challenge I needed to hear. What God had to teach me was this. It is not what I do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through me. God doesn't want worldly successes. He wants me. He wants my heart in submission to him. Life is not just a few years to spend on self-indulgence and career advancement. It's a privilege a responsibility, a stewardship to be lived according to a much higher calling, God's calling. This alone gives true meaning to life. Mordecai's warning to Esther is sobering. God forbid that someday I look back and realize I was too distracted by things of this world, too busy, too driven, and my work was given to another. The third challenge Providence. Esther, who knows but that God in his providence has brought you to such a time as this? What Mordecai's words say to me is that each one of us has a unique assignment in this world given to us by a sovereign God to love and to serve those within our own sphere of influence. We've been blessed to be a blessing. We've received that we might give. The challenges Esther needed to hear were challenges I needed to hear and continually need to hear, the call to total commitment. But there is one last lesson I had to learn from Esther, the way in which her heart responded. Esther called on her fellow believers to pray and to fast, and then she cast herself, indeed her very life, upon God in dependence on him. If I perish, I perish. And how did God work in this situation? What was the outcome of Esther's commitment and dependence on God? Scripture tells us that the king extended the golden scepter, sparing Esther's life, that his heart went out to her cause, and that God's people were gloriously rescued. Esther could have played it on her own wits and charm and just left God out of the picture. But she knew her cause would only succeed if God were with her, and she rallied others to join her in a spirit of humble dependence through prayer. It has struck me that this is really our purpose in gathering together this morning at this, the annual National Prayer Breakfast. We have come to humbly acknowledge our dependence on God. We have come as our invitations to this event state to seek the Lord's guidance and strength in our individual lives and in the governing of our nation with the hope that the power of Christ may deepen our fellowship with one another. But in this city, accustomed to giving directions, it's not easy to seek them instead. Dependence on God is not an easy thing for Washington-type achievers, and it has not been easy for me. Often I find myself faced with tasks demanding wisdom and courage beyond my own, and not just on the big decisions, I am constantly in need of God's grace to perform life's routine duties with the love for others, the peace, the joy inherent in God's call. I've had to learn that dependence is a good thing, that when I've used up my own resources, when I can't control things and make them come out my way, when I'm willing to trust God with the outcome, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. 
Then I'm in the best position to feel the power of Christ rest upon me, encourage me, replenish my energy, and deepen my faith. Power from God, not from me. Yes, the story of Esther is actually a story of dependence. It's a story not about the triumph of a man or a woman, but the triumph of God. He is the real hero of this story. And in the same way, I've come to realize there can be only one hero in my story, too, God and Jesus Christ. Total commitment to Christ is a high and difficult calling, and one I will struggle with the rest of my days. But I know that for me, it's the only life worth living, the only life worthy of our Lord. The world is ripe and ready, I believe, for men and women who will accept this calling, men and women who recognize they are not immune from the predicaments of the day, men and women who are willing to accept the privilege of serving and who are ready to see that the providence of God may have brought them to such a time as this. Thank you and God bless you. Secretary Dole, thank you for a most inspiring personal testimony. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to present to you someone who is deeply loved and respected, the President of the United States. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Distinguished clergy and senators and congressmen, guests, all our good friends, Nancy and I are delighted to be here with you today. It gives one a very good feeling to see so many of our national leaders here and so many representatives of other countries gathering together in a community of faith. 200 years ago, another group of statesmen gathered together in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation and bring forth our Constitution. They often found themselves at odds their purpose lost in acrimony and self-interest until Benjamin Franklin stood up and said, I have lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And then he called upon the convention to open each day with prayer. How, with so much against them, could our founding fathers have dared so much to declare for all the world and all future generations the rights of man, the dignity of the individual, the hopes of all humanity? Was it because they believed that God was on their side or was it because they prayed to discover how they might be on God's side? Our founding fathers knew that their hope was in prayer, and that's why our Declaration of Independence begins with an affirmation of faith and why our Congress opens every day with prayer. It is why the first Congress of the fledgling United States in the Northwest Ordinance provided for schools that would teach 
quote, religion, morality, and knowledge, because they knew that no man, no nation, could grow in freedom without divine guidance. If I might be allowed a, a personal note here, when I attended the commencement ceremonies at the Air Force Academy, I was surprised at how many of the graduating cadets came up to me, hand extended, 930 in all, and told me they were praying for me. When I mentioned this to the commanding general, he told me that every morning you could find several hundred cadets in the chapel beginning their day with prayer. Hardly a day goes by that I'm not told, sometimes in letters and sometimes by people I meet, that they're praying for me. It's a warm but humbling feeling. Sometimes I, I answer when someone says that. I feel I have to say something, and I tell them that if they ever get a busy signal, it's because I'm in there ahead of them. <laughs> I grew up in a home where I was taught to believe in intercessory prayer. I know it's those prayers, and millions like them, that are building high and strong this cathedral of freedom that we call America. Those prayers and millions like them that will always keep our country secure and make her a force for good in these two troubled times. And that's why a nation, as a nation, we must embrace our faith for as long as we endeavor to do good, and we must believe that will be always, we will find our strength, our hope, and our true happiness in prayer and in the Lord's will. I'd like to conclude with a story that is told by Dr. Paul Brand, the noted leprosy specialist, in his book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Dr. Brand tells us of how after World War II, a group of German students, young people, volunteered to help rebuild a cathedral in England that had been a casualty of the Luftwaffe bombings. And as the work progressed, debate broke out on how best to restore a large statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched and bearing the familiar inscription, Come unto me. Careful patching could repair all damage to the statue except for Christ's hands which had been destroyed by bomb fragments. Should they attempt the delicate task of reshaping those hands? And finally, the young workers reached a decision that still stands today. The statue of Jesus has no hands, but the inscription now reads, Christ has no hands but ours. Isn't that really what he was always trying to tell us? Trying to tell us that we must be the hands, as we've heard so eloquently here by so many already today. Well, thank you all. God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. President. I often wonder what visitors to the Capitol must think when they pass by the door of the House of Representatives members' prayer breakfast and hear 50 or so Republicans and Democrats singing that wonderful Christian hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Our song leader in those breakfasts is the Honorable Danny Akaka of Hawaii. Will you please stand and join him in singing another well-known hymn, the words of which are printed in your program, Amazing Grace. Remain standing after the song for prayer. Let us express our, our faith 
and our commitment in this song. We'll sing the second verse without accompaniment and we'll modulate into a higher key for the third verse. Let's sing together Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me and gentlemen, we close this time of fellowship with a prayer by a man whose entire life has been devoted to a single cause, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one has done it with greater dedication or greater impact. After the player, prayer, please remain in your places until the President and Mrs. Reagan and Vice President and Mrs. Bush have had an opportunity to leave. For our closing prayer, the Dr. Billy Graham. Thank you, Dan, President Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, Vice President Bush, Mrs. Bush, distinguished guest. Patrick Henry wrote in his will, I have now disposed of all my property to my family. There's one thing more I wish I could give them, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that, and I had not given them one shilling, they would be rich. And if I had not given them that, and I had given them all the world, they would be poor indeed. Our faith has been encouraged this morning. I've been to every one of these prayer breakfasts since the first one except two. And I believe this is one of the most moving that I have attended in all these years. We're grateful for all of those that have participated and led us, and we leave here the richer for it. And I'm going to ask that we have a moment of silent prayer. And let us pray, not only for the leaders of the nation and the world, but let us pray for those that are hostages, our friend Terry Waite and others that are trying to do something, and for all of those that are in need of prayer today that may be in prisons or wherever, and pray for ourselves and our families in just one moment of silent prayer, and then I'll say just a brief benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance unto thee and give thee peace.
Let us go in peace. This has been a great morning. Mr. President and Mrs. Reagan, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Bush, we thank you for being with us. And we thank all of you for your participation here this morning. May each of us leave here with joy in our hearts and a renewed commitment to serve the God who made us and who loves us. Mr. President, thank you. Real nice to